Hello, I'm Jordan Lloyd Bookie, Chief Mom and Co-Founder over at Zubin, and I'm very, very excited tonight to welcome Betsy Bird to our Zubin on a Zubin Experts on Air series. So welcome, Betsy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, we were just talking a little bit beforehand, but I didn't get the chance to tell Betsy that the way when we first sort of moved into this world, I came to children's literature and the world of um, of kid lit and all this more by way of you know personal experience with my own kids. I was an educator before, but wasn't in the deep and very layered world of children's literature. And one of our curators, we have these librarians who help us um, curate the books in our collection from around the country. And I just remember when we had very first launched in Zubin, you know, maybe seven or eight months ago, somebody wrote, one of the curators wrote and said, oh my gosh, like Betsy Bird wrote about you on her blog. And I was like, that is so great. You know, some PR that we didn't know what it was. But it was, they were completely awed. Like, so they felt so excited to be working for this company that was featured on Betsy Bird's blog. And I thought, okay. So I started, I went, I checked out Fuse8, and I was, it was amazing. It's become like this complete wealth of information um, for us. And just really, uh, I love the, I love your voice there. And not, not just because you wrote about Zubin, which obviously was, you know. Appreciated, but because you always had these really like fresh takes, fresh perspective, really honest. And I joked about that in the um, welcome for the or the sort of description of the of the hangout. But it's completely true. You're always giving these uh, very real, you know, opinions and having great conversations that I don't know that everybody in children's literature is having. And you have this awesome community of people who are commenting and you know really um, building a discussion around it. So I am very thrilled to have you here. Um, we can, before we get into the like real introductions, uh, just so people know, if you're watching right now, you can actually um, put a question directly into the Hangout, and we'll be able to see it and answer here if you have a question. Uh, otherwise, you can tweet us at Zubin for Kids, and we'll be monitoring there, so, um, so hope to hear from you. And uh, so I already mentioned that I'm the chief mom at Zubin, uh, Betsy is a children's specialist for New York Public Library. That means she's what I consider the, the queen of New York Library. I don't know, for, for kids. Uh, but you want to give us a little bit more, a little bit of background of, on yourself and sort of how, how you got to be where you are. Sure. Um, just the quickie, the quick and dirty on my career. Um, you know, I moved to New York with a, with a brand new library degree. Uh, my first job was at the Jefferson Market Branch, which is the most glorious branch in all of New York City. It's a castle. It's in Greenwich Village. And they, like, I walked in the first day and they were like, do you want to do children's or do you want to do YA? And I had to decide right there. And I said, uh, the children's room is much larger. I will do children's. <laughs> and um, thank God I did. Worked there for a while uh, and started a blog while I was there. Um, blogging was very new. I had read an SLJ article on how to start a blog for your school library. And I was like, ooh, let's do this for a public library. And uh, the public library was like, no, 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 no. We don't blog. We don't know what blogging is. Um, you can make your own. I was like, oh, I will make my own. And so I made my own. And that helped me get a job with the central children's room, which was like the biggest children's room in, in your public library. And from there, um, I actually moved up. And now I am the youth material specialist for near public library, which means I buy all the books uh, for Manhattan, Staten Island, and the Bronx for kids. Um, so if I see a kid on the subway, I could be like, I bought you that. Ha, ha, ha. Unless you're going, um, to, Brook unless you're going to Brooklyn. Then yeah, that, no, I can't. Well, yeah. well actually, they actually merged recently with Brooklyn <laughs> in terms of our collection. So I actually work with Brooklyn now. Um, and I will be uh, purchasing for them as well at some point, um, at least part of their collection. Um, because now we are a, a, a separate entity called Book Ops, uh, which is a combination of near public library and, and Brooklyn. And we're one big merge thing, but I also, you know, I, I buy for NYPL, so I'm, I'm NYPL. And how did you? So I have questions about that, but just how did you? Did you always know you wanted to be a librarian? I've, I've read, uh, I think, sort of like posts around the internet where you said, well, it sort of it like came to me. Did you know you always wanted to work when, with children or YA and that sort of? Oh, like, yeah. how, how did? How did? What's the story of of how that came to be? I thought tooth and nail against librarianship with every pustule in my being. I, uh, you know, I was the kid who 
would take the VCR tapes, and you know how when you got a blank VCR tape, because I'm, you know, old school, and they came with, like, the little sheet and had little stickers and numbers and things. Mm -hmm. I made, like, a, like a complex, like, uh, graph of w with the numbers, <laughs> where you could find them, alphabetized all the books in the house, took my National Geographics and started making subject heading lists for fun, because, you know, you never know when you might have to do something on capuchin monkeys, and <laughs> this useful guide for me. <laughs> um, that's what I did for fun, but I was like, not librarianship, no, that's a lame, boring job. I want to be a photographer. And uh, so I, but I hedged my bets, because I'm not stupid, and uh, so I was, a, I was a double major fine arts slash photography and English. Okay. And uh, went out to be a photographer. I'm a horrible photographer. Uh, <laughs> fun fact, I just, you know, something happens and then I press the shutter, so... That was not the job for me. Um, so I was like, fine, fine, I'll go to librarianship, but it's going to be archival librarianship. I'm going to preserve books. And I think it was my husband who, one day I came home from, from my library school, and he was like, Betsy, you, you, you have put your coffee cup on your book on how to preserve books. I was like, it's a sign. All right, never mind. And I took a kid's course on a lark, like a kid's book course, because I'm like, easy day. Um, took it and it was like lightning just like hit me. It was like, oh my gosh. I had been reading Harry Potter since I had gone to England in 99. And my mom who worked in a bookstore was like, hey, pick up this Harry Potter book for me. And I, I walked into Waterstones and I was like, do you have something by Harry Potter? And uh, <laughs> they were like, children's. And I started reading children's books after that. I read Phil Pullman. I started reading Holes. I just started reading it on my own for no particular reason. And then I had a reason. And so suddenly I was like, okay, but I didn't, even then I was like confusing children's librarianship with teaching. I was like, well, but I don't like kids. I like kids. <laughs> kids are great. Kids are awesome. I didn't, I was thinking that I had to see the same kids like from like morning till night. No, no, that's <laughs> cheap. And I have nothing but respect for people who do that, but kids. Well, wait, know. okay, so speaking of kids, um, off, off, not going down like a different route for a second, you do, you have a two and a half year old now. How is having how is having your own child sort of changed, changed the way that you view um, children's books, or ha has it given you a different perspective, especially for those early years? I mean, she's really young. But are, the, are the books that you thought she would love or that you love do they end up being the ones that stick, or are you are you sort of surprised, I guess, by what you experience with her? Yeah, I mean, my I wanted to fight this to a certain extent because I didn't want to be the parent who was like, well, my two-year-old didn't approve of this book written for a seven-year-old, therefore it's a terrible book. You know, I wanted to, like, have some balance. Um, she had, <clears throat> forgive me, I am fighting a horrible cold in my throat. Let me take a quick drink and then I'll answer. No problem. Mm. <clears throat> what I found was that I was doing, like, I would do recommended age levels on my reviews for picture books. They were way too high. <laughs> I had no idea that to what, you know, a one-year-old was capable, what a two-year-old was capable of. I was way underestimating kids um, in general, what they have a capacity to pay attention to, what they're ready for. She's really given me wonderful insights um, from an educational standpoint, um, from, a, from a childhood development standpoint, um, you know, which I think is very important when you are reviewing. I don't think that that delegitimates, you know, makes any less legitimate my previous reviews, but I, she does give me insight into things that I would not notice. She points out things in books that I'm going to review that I wouldn't notice otherwise. Um, we actually just read uh, together uh, a book that John J. Muth has coming out later this month, I think on the 25th, um, called Haiku, uh, Hi, comma, K-O-O, -O, and it's a, it's a haiku book of seasons with uh, this adorable panda. And I didn't think to read it with her, but then she was like, let's read that. And I was like, okay. The panda. And I, thought I did. You know, you know, she really gave me like some, like she pointed out things I wouldn't have noticed, and we went through the whole thing. So yeah, no, it's, it's been a boon. Um, and I'm expecting a boy next, so that's good. You know, get oh. get like, even handed like gender perspective there. Yeah. So. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Another topic. Okay. So when I um, when I tied, when I when I sent out the email to our to the folks in our newsletter, I referred to you as a rock star librarian, which you humbly said you wondered who I was speaking about, but that's 
I was um, speaking earlier. Who are some of the other who are some of your you know peers, colleagues that you that you really admire and as you sort of moved into the role that you're in now, you've you've um, drawn things from for your own career and some of your selections, you know, whose whose taste you admire, whose um, you know, decisions, things along those lines. Well, because I came in, in such a, a sort of a blogger fashion, a lot of the librarians that I really admire, or, or even like just book experts, um, are librarians. Though I admire many librarians who do not blog as well, certainly. Um, just some names off the top of my head of people that I just really love to read the opinions of and really trust the opinions of. Um, oh, gosh, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to whittle it down. I mean, um, there's Monica Enninger. Um, she does a blog called uh, Educating Alice. She's actually a, a fourth grade teacher at the Dalton School. Great perspectives on books. Things that I wouldn't even think of half the time she comes up with. Um, on the YA side, uh, there's Jennifer Hubert Swan. She works at the Little Red Schoolhouse as a librarian. Um, and then there's like Layla Roy. She writes the Bookshelves of Doom blog. Um, and then whoever the women are behind the, the book smugglers, they're amazing. Like when people ask for YA recommendations, I'm like, I not go there. That's where I don't do that. Do that. There. Um, on the children's side, you know, from the academic standpoint, um, I love the opinions of like Philip Nell, um, and uh, and uh, oh gosh, who are all the other people? It's funny. It's like it's like a, like a just it's just there's so many. <laughs> there's just like a plethora of really talented people out there. And if you know who to look for, um, Susanna Richards, uh, she is sort of the magical elf of children's literature. She appears at your elbow and gives you what you need, and then she disappears. She's amazing. Everyone knows her somehow. It's bizarre. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, and, it, it, and I'm always finding new people. That's the crazy thing is that, you know, yay, Internet. Um, if, you, if you ever think you're running out of experts, yeah, you got a whole new pool you can draw from here and there. So it's wonderful. It actually speaks to another question that I was um, thinking about with you and, and you've spoken to before I know is, um, you know, the, the Internet is wonderful. It's allowing us to have this conversation right now. And, but people do have so much access to information. You can go and, you know, uh, presumably find whatever it is we think we need for our kids. What, what do you think in this, in the sort of the world where people are putting a lot more apps on our, on our uh tablets, phones, whatever, there's so many more options for what kids can be doing, right? Um, what have you seen in just the time that you, you were there at the sort of the onset of blogging, what has been the transition, if anything, in, in your role as a librarian, and do you see that sort of shifting a little bit because technology is, you know, changing? I know you, I'm guessing you have, like, e-books at your library, too, so that's one thing, but in general, sort of, do you, do you see that shifting at all? No, it's funny. Um, you know, it, New York Public Library is a little strange where we order centrally, so I really do buy for everybody. Um, in other systems, the individual librarians would be able to buy for themselves. In my case, I buy for, um, you know, 89 branches. Um, so I've, yeah, with ebooks, we've certainly, we've, we've dipped into that. We do a fair amount of ebooks. What I found, um, for a while I, w I had my job and I also ran a kids book group, um, which was really useful because I could actually talk to the kids. And they would use ebooks. They often didn't know the library provided them. Um, this was always news to them. I'd be like, if the library had ebooks, would you check them out? And they'd be like, yes! I'm like, okay, we've had them for like two years. They're like, what? <laughs> um, so I find often libraries have a hard time really promoting the fact that they even have ebooks. And then on top of that, um, there is the fact that a lot of studies are being done right now um, on how kids use ebooks, how that's been changing over the years. In some of the most recent ones, and sometimes there's conflicting reports either way, generally what I've found, kids are like otters. They, they slip back and forth between print and ebooks with an ease because it's natural to them. You know, with adults, they're like, oh, shiny shiny new. Kids um, are shiny new, but then you give it a year and it's not new anymore. It's like old hats. Like it's always been there. There have always been ebooks for a certain generation of kids. Absolutely. So, but they love covers. They'll use ebooks when they are um, in public often if they're reading below their grade level. 
and they don't want to sh people to see them holding like goosebumps and you know and they're huh. sixth grade. Um, but in private and in bed, it, bizarrely, they will use print books. They prefer print books. Um, and I we have not seen our cert go down. Um, what has happened has been as we've increased ebooks. I used to give out the library cards um, at the library. We saw people who had never had a library card coming in to get library cards just for the ebooks. So suddenly there's this whole new market that's being tapped into. It's not draining from the print market. Right. Uh, actually adding on to our market, which is fantastic. Um, and with the kids, um, the kids are a part of that. And you know, they, they love books as much as ever. So yeah, I mean the, the only difference I think is more on the publishing side. There's just so many more books right now. There yeah. are. Uh, We've ever, and you know, add in the self-publishing market on top of that, and you know, how do you keep up? That's always the question. The real question is how you keep up. But so, and with all the blogs, right? This is like the onslaught of information. I wonder. Um, so we just passed. You had a really awesome pre and post game show uh, before the the big uh, ALA awards were all. Uh, announced, I guess a little. It's been over a week at this point, yeah. Or a week? Yeah, a little over the week, yeah. Um, but that's you know, for anybody who's watching and doesn't know, you know, the Oscars of kids' books and and YA, and uh, was was wondering sort of now that it's been a little while. We heard you, if you, if anybody wants to watch that and hang out, you can see what your some of your initial reactions were. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts now, sort of looking at it? Are you how do you feel about the? We can start with uh, Caldecott, and we can talk about other awards too. But just, I'd love to know what you what you thought about um, that particular award and the winners and the uh, the winner and the honors, um, locomotive, and then who you thought was missing, what you wish you what you wish you had seen, or if you're just like thrilled with what was there. Overall, I was very happy with what won, and you know, every year. The nice thing, and, and I mentioned this when we were talking earlier before the thing, but what I like about the Newbery and the Caldecott, you know, the greatest awards we give to children's books today, is that there is no short list. Um, we don't know what's going to win from one given moment to another given moment. Um, anything that's eligible, which is to say published in America first um, that year by someone with I don't even, I guess it's resident, it's not residency, it's like they actually have to live in America some of the time. <coughs> that can win. Hold on. <coughs> so, I always have my, my villains, you know, the ones that you were like, oh, if that one wins, I shall be pounding yeah. my head on the table repeatedly. <laughs> um, none of my villains uh, won anything this year. Um, or if they did, they won in the category that I thought was more appropriate for them. Um, so that was great. Um, uh, and I Do you have anything that was like your biggest surprise between uh, Newbery, Caldecott, or any oh, of the awards that were now set? Uh, I think I think Flora and Ulysses was the biggest surprise, like the, the Newbery winner, um, because I didn't think it was eligible. Um, not because I didn't think it was a good book. I liked it very much. I mean. Come on, it's about a, a girl with a squirrel, and the squirrel gets vacuumed up and then has superpowers. <laughs> What's not to love about that? That's just a good premise. A kid would actually want to pick up and read that book. Because sure. you know, we get these like, oh, is the Newberry lost its way? It's so boring every year for the children have to read these books. <laughs> I don't kind of agree with the ones I say are boring. Sometimes I do, but not always. Uh, but you know, at this one, you know, nobody's gonna say like, "Kids gonna be bored to death with this story of a squirrel with superpowers who <laughs> really wants to eat a giant donut." I'm like, "That's an awesome story." Um, but it has a lot of cartoon elements, and I so I thought that would just like you know, cut it out of the running. But uh, I guess we had a gutsy Newberry panel this year, and they did not think that was going to happen. Um, yeah, so that was my biggest surprise. Um, and then on the well, the, the other bigger surprise was when we're talking about Caldecott, uh, Locomotive, a nonfiction book that's not a biography. Yeah, Caldecott. That I hesitate to say that's never happened, but if it has happened, it happened a really long time ago. I think Shadow, back in the fifties, maybe would count, but it it's been a long time. 
Um, and you know, with the rise of Common Core, I had to say it. Uh, you know, there's a lot more concentration on nonfiction these days. And this you book, I, that, oh, sorry to interrupt, but do you experience that? Um, I know the school librarians. That's such a huge component of you know making decisions about their own collection and how you know at so so at so many levels is important. Do you also experience that as a, a public library? You know, we get a lot of parents walking in asking for the Common Core list. Um, you know, there's a lot of misperceptions. There's a lot of misinformation. So I, a lot of my job is working with a, a great coworker of mine, and we go around and we, we just inform everybody, like, what is Common Core? What does it mean? What do you tell a parent when they say, like, how do I prepare my kid for Common Core? So I do a lot of work with that. Uh, and we do have parents who walk or well, and, they, and the kids get the, the assignment, like, you know, I need a picture book that's a first-person narration. It's like, you know, okay. You know, we have to prepare our librarians working on the front lines to deal with, you know, um, you know, to deal with all the, the, the code words in some ways that come along with, with the core curriculum. So yeah, we do, we do a fair amount of that. Um, but I think, you know, going back to Locomotive, um, you know, there's a book that ties in beautifully. It is a beautiful book. Um, really beautifully done, long. Um, you know, he, I've been advocating for Brian Floca, the author, to win a Caldecott for years. He did a book called Moonshot. Yeah. which I thought was robbed the year it came out. I don't think it even got a cyber, maybe it got a cyber honor or something pitiful like that, but it didn't get a Caldecott. It deserved a Caldecott. So this was sort of like the, the Caldecott committee making it up to me. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> we didn't give you the one on the moon, but we're giving yeah, you the one on your credibility on the track. Absolutely. I'm like, all right, I forgive you. Yes, all right, as long as he wins something. Um, okay, so I have another a question that's related to, as we're talking about, like, picture books, Common Core, um, and you mentioned that it's long, and one thing that I notice, and you must notice with parents, is, um, you know, 95% of our customers, uh, at some point, if, not, that's not true, this is, that's an exaggeration, a lot of people, if they write to us about anything, about uh, a book that they've received, um, they'll, they'll usually, we oftentimes will see people who will say their child's um, level, and for us levels are um, much less numeric in terms of how we you know, define them more like growing reader, independent reader, their um, wider ranges. Um, we'll have people who have a five or a six year old independent reader looking for like chapter books and it doesn't want picture books and these things that um, you know, it ends up being a lot of conversation, right? And I wonder, as a librarian, like, how do you handle that, especially when people are looking toward, for more nonfiction, which necessarily, in a lot of cases, means looking, you know, outside of picture books, not entirely, obviously, there's a great nonfiction there, but, you know, what do you, what do, you do when someone comes, oh, my kid's, you know, advanced? They don't oh, need yeah. Well, I mean, we, I mean, I'm working in New York City, so every child is advanced. That's you right. Know? Yeah, they're gifted. Yeah, or a large portion of them. And, you know, you get, you know, on the sad side, you'll get, like, I just heard about a parent of a four-year-old refuses to allow her to read picture books, insists that she's bored by them. No, she only reads novels at this point. There's so much damage that can be done to a child when you do yeah. that. Besides the fact that picture books have a higher reading level, quite frankly, than uh, exactly. the one of like, easy yeah. books. You know, they're like, oh, my kid's ready for easy books. I'm like, okay, have you looked at the vocab of your average picture book? Yeah, you'll see the Lexile oh, view up here, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah, look at the Lexile levels for crying out loud, you know. So, you know, we, but, you know, we try to provide something for everyone, and we don't level our books for that very reason, um, partly because there's so many different types of leveling. But we will get the parents who go to the easy book section. And, you know, we put up, the letters we put on the spines are the first initial of the last name. So they'll go to the off, like the L authors, and just take them all and go to check them out, thinking that's level L. And the librarian, if they're canny, will look at this and be like, "You are aware that this is just the complete works of Arnold Lobel, and this is not, uh, what you're thinking you're getting." You know, I mean, there is, yeah, and exactly. I mean, that's the thing. Like every kid is different, so leveling assumes that they're all, you know. But, you know, with some forms of leveling, there's an element of competition that some kids really get into. So <laughs> it's, it's so strange. But, yeah, public libraries in general don't level their books. Um, 
but we watch it very closely. Um, and there's recently been a real push on some parents' parts for books to be rated. Um, they're like, rate movies, why don't they rate books, you know? Yeah, um, like cursing, swearing, yeah, yeah drinking. Yeah, exactly. Meat. And the question is, well, who's doing the rating? And are you the kind of rating board that would consider gay parents uh, something that only a teenager should read about? And, you know, it's... Right. It's a tricky, right here. tricky subjects here, yeah. So, yeah, we'll see where it all falls out. Speaking of... Um, some of these, uh, you know, sort of like the ratings or I guess these are some of the trends that you're seeing, right? Or these are, this is what you're seeing. People are looking for uh, maybe that, like, the, the rating piece is important, Common Core. I'm hearing some of these um, things that you're noticing in the library. I wonder, one of the posts that you wrote about recently and then again today, uh, or yesterday, I guess, is around um, seeing diversity in the, um, the covers of books that were coming out and it was sort of, and, and certainly there's been a lot of data over the past few years that's come out showing, um, you know, the lack of diversity in picture books and uh, and now it seems like we're maybe on the cusp of a, of a different trend, at least from the covers of the books we're seeing and um, today your post was about what you were calling casual diversity, what we refer to as incidental ethnicity, what some people were calling, there were so many different uh, Names was being oh, yeah, about names. The, yeah. basically uh, you know books that aren't about a person being whatever they are, but are just that person just happens to be uh, in most cases not white, and uh, and that's just it still might like I use the example of might be like you know pinkalicious, but not a white character. But what are your thoughts on where that's going? There was such an active uh, discussion about it still going on right now on your blog and. And what do you sort of see as trends? You're getting all the you know preview books and seeing what's coming up. Well, in terms of the covers, um, 2014 is one of the better years I've seen in terms of middle grade. I have seen more kids of color. I've seen two books, and this won't sound impressive at all, but you have to understand what we've seen in previous years. Two books where a boy, a Latino boy, his face is on the cover. This is almost unheard of. Um, when Latino boys get on covers, their faces do not get on the covers, if they're published at all, which they almost never are. I can't think of a single solitary Latino boy book from last year uh, where he was the main character. Um, maybe there was one. Couldn't tell you what it was. Um, but I'm seeing more this year, and I've seen a lot of African-American boys and girls on covers. Full face, you know, because the thing is, in the what they've done in the past is a back silhouettes, where they're like running, mm -hmm. you know, and then you hear people are like, oh, well, kids won't pick up a book with uh, a kid of color on the cover, and I'm like, okay, first of all, like kids, uh, you know, you know, maybe the kids you talk to, uh, you can't say all kids, and what it is is when they do have the face of a kid of color on the cover, it's usually really boring looking. It's usually historical fiction and very meaningful, and it looks very boring. And no, the kid is not, you know, if the kid wants something about crazy alien robots from outer space, they're not going to pick up the one because there are almost none with kids of color fighting crazy alien robots from outer space, which is the crime right there. So <coughs> this year we're seeing more, and we're seeing more fun yeah. kids of color on covers, which is a really tricky thing. Because, and that brings us to, like, yeah, casual diversity, uh, incidental ethnicity, that was a post I should learn. I where I'm like I have these like topics that I could put on the blog when there's nothing going on. I'm like I don't want to write a really thoughtful post tonight. What do I have? It's like oh yeah, this was a case where a friend of mine who's a parent um, has a young child and was like, hey, she used the term with me. She was like, hey, can you have any like recommended casual diversity books? And I was like. Oh, all right, yeah, sort of, yeah. You know, and I, I looked up the term, and it's a term used with television mostly and, and movies. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. And so I came up with some books, and I was like, oh, I'll just like, put these on my blog, and that'll be fine. <laughs> and, you know, you can't just put something about race on your blog and think, eh, nobody's going to notice about it. It's fine. Like, it just... It... You know, I think what was really great about it is that it was actually it was a really interesting conversation, and people were giving all sorts of, you know, recommendations, and it actually ended up being, it was a very, um, I think, like, constructive, it has been a very constructive series of comments. It has been. I, I was a little surprised there wasn't more pushback. 
Yeah. Um, the has been pushed back against the term, and I can't blame them for that. Mm. Um, casual diversity, it's the word casual. It's, it's, it's not ideal. Um, it's hard, and yeah, it's a mental uh, ethnicity. It doesn't roll off the tongue. Right. Um, you know, it'd be nice if we had like a quickie like buzzword that we all loved, but we don't seem to. Yeah. Uh, so until we do, um, that's the one that I'm going with. Um, there was some concern um, voiced uh, by by someone that um, you know if you take away the importance of the ethnicity, then you're just saying everybody's the same, and that's just as dangerous. Um, which you know, there's a point to be made there. <coughs> by the same token. Find me a book with a kid of color learning to brush their teeth, use the potty, or have a dead pet. Um, they don't exist. So, you know, it's it, it's tricky. You have to walk the line. You have to avoid the black best friend on television problem where, for no particular reason, these white characters have a black best friend and there's no reason for it. It just seems to have been inserted. Um, you want to it wants you want it to be natural. You want it to make sense. Um, by the same token, you want to show that this is a diverse world that we live in. And there's, you know, I've read two picture books, came out this year. Large groups of people are pictured and they're all white. And it's mm -hmm. like, we can't, you know, in the days of Curious George, you could get away with that. And yeah. you're a different day and age, especially in New York. I mean, everywhere, everywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's I know, I just want to. That's the point, so. So I realize as we're talking, I, first of all, I'm noticing the time, but I think we're just going to go over a little bit because I noticed that there are actually some questions that came through, and I want to make sure that we get to speak to them. Um, and I would definitely encourage people to check out Fuse 8 blog uh, if you're interested in this conversation because the dialogue is still it is ongoing, and it's really interesting. Talk to um, that. <laughs> a couple of, a couple of quest questions. Um, one is, oh, good, okay, so you've got... You took care of Tracy, so thank you. That was uh, she was asking you about the chapter book, so we, we answered that one, I think, for you. Um, and the other one uh, it comes from Shadra, who is wondering about what you think the sort of best things we can do to support our libraries um, financially and not financially. What are the things that we can go out and do um, beyond getting our library card, which seems like a, a great place to start if you haven't gone there already. What else are the things that we should be doing to support our libraries? Use your library card. Um, getting it's great, but actually using it is what counts uh, in the end. Um, when there are referendums and chances to vote for uh, doing things for your library, vote for your library. Uh, get out the vote. Um, can't say anything better than that. And uh, support your school librarian. You know, the public libraries face danger of cuts all the time. It's the school librarians who are the superheroes as far as I'm concerned, particularly public school librarians. They are constantly cut. They are constantly, they do more work than anybody else, as far as I can tell. Um, if you have a school librarian, support them, give them love, and make it clear to your principal that you need that school library. Um, those are the folks that I have the most concern about, generally. That's interesting. Um, do you... So school librarians, they're picking books for their entire school, obviously. You're picking books for an entire huge city. Of only school. three boroughs. It's only three boroughs. Okay. But it's soon to be four, soon to be basically four. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> what, what, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility. So, you know, what do you have, what is yours, like, do you have, you must have, you said you're, you, you're a librarian, for goodness sakes. What goes into that? process, how does your process for that look, for making those decisions every year? I mean, that seems... I can't do it one. without, yeah, I can't do it without my individual librarians in each branch. So I have, you know, all my little branches, all 89 of them, and every single children's librarian there, and I get constant feedback from them um, so that I know, and I have this crazy chart. You should see my crazy chart. I have a crazy nonfiction chart of like every topic you could name. I'm let down to like different animals, like cheetahs. Here are the branches that want books on cheetahs, dogs, you know, elephants, manta rays. So Just you're every possible. You're maintaining the list of their of, of what their they're requests. looking for, and and yeah. 
Wow, and and so then and then you basically take that right. as well, your guide for your orders. And I've almost visited them all. I haven't gotten all of them yet, but I, my goal is to visit all eighty-nine. Every time I see one, I suddenly understand more you about. Are, you are the queen of New York. Libraries <laughs> for children. Hey, the Bronx you're is visiting, great. You're visiting all. <laughs> yeah, I've learned so much. I'm like, Staten Island's really cool, and the Bronx is amazing. <laughs> How come people are moving to the Bronx? The Bronx is great. Um, yeah, so I, you know, and so I get, I can, I now having seen the branches, I can be like, okay, you have like no nonfiction. I should be up in your nonfiction. You've gained way too many picture books. I'm taking down your picture books. They have to tell me these things because I can't visit them all the time because I do have to like, you know, order sometimes. But it's really useful to actually walk in the branch and actually see the community see who's working there. By the same token, we have uh, people from the city coming in telling us how the demographics are shifting. Yeah. Um, in New York right now, for example, big influx. Um, the biggest, the rising <coughs> language is French. Big influx, influx of uh, African, uh, French-speaking nations uh, coming in. So suddenly we're getting more requests for French books. Got to up the French books. Um, you know, and you know, we've got to pay attention to who's moving where and who you know, who's going around. Which branch is not getting as much attention these days? Which branch? How is often do you like place orders, as it were? Uh, or is it an ongoing process all year round? It's pretty ongoing. I mean, I get monthly carts of new stuff. So right now I'm ordering books for April um, for the branches. Um, and then at the same, by the same token, all my librarians can put requests for books into little carts, and then I go through those carts and either approve or don't approve of them. Um, most requested book in children's? Most, oh, most requested book right now? I mean, Wimpy Kid always, forever and always, Wimpy Kid, um, number one in everyone's hearts. Um, but there have been some like surprising books that you know I didn't think they'd catch on too much, and then they caught on, like Gangbusters, like um, My Zombie Goldfish. Um, who knew My Zombie Goldfish was going to be the hot, you know? <laughs> um, and picture books, I cannot predict. I cannot predict which picture books are going to explode the day the crayons quit biggest thing that ever happened in the world. It is like the number one like top selling, even after the Caldecott, I think, um, still like the top selling like picture book right now. And you know, I did not see that, you know, Pinkalicious when back in that when that happened, I didn't see that coming, you know. Yeah. You can't predict picture books. You can kind of predict fiction, but not yeah, but but really not not picture books. So this is gonna take me to one of the last um Last two questions, um, especially speaking about the day the crayons quit, because Oliver Jeffers would be at my dinner table. Um, uh, I was going to ask you about. Uh, he's very cute. He's got that. He's got that Northern Irish accent. Yeah. <laughs> and that's definitely not why I'm a happily married woman. Uh, uh -huh. So, <laughs> uh, no. Who? If you, I was asked. I was going to ask if you had. If you were having dinner or coffee for. Let's call it dinner for. Um, for three people. Uh, authors or illustrators, living or not not living, uh, who would they be? Who do you want to Who do you want to meet and talk with? So this is this is my horrible promotion of a of a book I have coming out in August actually of this year. Um, I did a book on the true stories behind children's books um, with two other bloggers um, called Wild Things: Acts of Mischief in Children's Literature. With all the research, I got to know a lot of these authors really well, and so my reaction is number one, Shel Silverstein. Who was a freak? You would <laughs> love to have dinner with that guy. He was crazy. He'd hit on you the whole time. Really? Like, Great. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, the years he lived in the Playboy Mansion. I'm just gonna say, wow. <laughs> okay. So, Shel Silverstein, number one, um, just because he's fascinating in general, just really interesting guy. Number two, James Marshall, who did um, he did the George and Martha Hippo um, books, but he's done a lot of books. If you saw his style, you'd instantly recognize it. Um, it's, and all his books are amazing. His nurse, his Mother Goose book is just fabulous. Um, and he was really funny. Really wry. And then number three is tricky because I want to say Sendak, but I think I'd be too intimidated and then I'd probably get into a fight with him in some way, which would be really Even unfortunate. After that Colbert show piece, you don't think? Yes, I know. Well, he, he was he was on death's door when he did that thing, so imagine what he's like when he's like, you know, in his prime. Dear God. Um, <laughs> I don't want to do a woman anyway. Uh, and so 
oh, it's so hard to choose. You know, I'm going to count, and this is cheating. I'm going to say Ursula Nordstrom. Okay. She was technically a children's author. She was primarily the editor of all the great children's authors out there. But she was a hoot. Um, Leonard Marcus collected her, her letters in Dear Genius. Oh, she was opinionated and funny. Um, and you would totally want to have dinner with her. So she's my number three. I like it. Uh, we should mention, because we didn't early, the, earlier, that Betsy is also the author of a Giant Dance Party, which is uh, a children's book in and of itself and one of our uh, personal favorites at our house. It, I was telling Betsy before that actually uh, inspired my uh, my son, who had sort of steered clear before ballet. I let him you know, decide what he wants to do, but he came back after we, after we read that book several times, and he wanted to sign up for a, a Tippy Toes dance at his school, and he totally loves it, and you know, oftentimes equates himself with having a, a giant dance party. So um, it's a great read, and definitely pick it up. Um, and speaking of reads, let's close out with hearing what do you do? You read, you know, uh, non children or <laughs> YA? <laughs> what what are you? What is on your nightstand? If it's not a, ch a children's book, I can tell you what's on my nightstand because it's been there for the last. <laughs> Four years? It's A.S. Byatt's The Children's Hour. Now, it's about E. Nesbitt, who was a children's author, so you'd think I'd be able to get through it because it was based on that, but it's an actual work of adult fiction. Okay. Um, yeah, haven't gotten through that. Um, did read, when, I, when I read adult books, Exciting. <laughs> they tend to be about children's books. It's a great <laughs> Rocket Johnson, Ruth Krauss book that came out. It was awesome. I <laughs> Phil Nell. Loved it. The last thing I read that was an adult book that had nothing to do with children's books at all was Bossy Pants by Tina Fey. And I'm very proud of that, that I read it cover to cover. It's a very fast read. Actually. I love that book. I that, love that. I, that is probably my, that is my number one recommended book for, you know, yeah. especially for women in business. I just, I love that book in general. I yeah. love her. So my answer is no, I don't read adult books. Um, I just read kids' books mostly, which is really unhealthy um, because you can't. You, you have to cleanse your palate once in a while, uh, which I fail to do, which is probably why I am as twisted and weird as I am. <laughs> I don't know about twisted and weird, but I do know that you definitely defy uh, any stereotype that somebody might have about a librarian. And so... I really, you know, I really appreciate that. I think anybody uh, who's a, a book lover and, um, you know, just it's it's really it's awesome what you're doing to, um, you know, make I think having a having a pre and post game show for the book awards. I mean, it's just all these things that are really you know adding a lot of um, excitement. Dare I say, swagger to children. Ooh. <laughs> children. Like that. So, uh, no, seriously, it's 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 awesome, and just we we thank you for all of your support of of Zubin, obviously, and um, and and in general, all the awesome content that you're putting out there. Maybe it's because you're eat, sleeping, breathing children's books, but uh, it's certainly for the betterment of of all of us. So, thank you, and thanks for joining us. And the one last request that we have is that you put the picture of the crazy chart on your blog. I don't know if that's something you want to do, but that's a request from from uh, Tracy, who's watching. <laughs> okay, good to know. Crazy Charlie, she'll be. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Betsy. All right. Thank Bye. you for having me.